So I will just share with you some case presentations. These have educational purposes. So you're welcome to, you're encouraged to, to unmute yourself and give your opinions. It doesn't have to be specifically on the case I'm showing, but it's just to see how you treat the refractory, refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a recent second opinion I had at my office. This is a 22-year-old woman. Uh, next, please. Who was diagnosed in 2021 with a stage three a nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. She was treated in first line with ABVD. Had, she had no intern PET scan, uh, mainly because she was diagnosed, or she was pregnant, so she had to delay her treatment. And she had no interim evaluation and she had no immediate response evaluation due to the birth of the baby. But at the time of evaluation, post treatment, she had a PET CT which showed at the real score of five. Next slide. So this is the, the uh, she had new uh, lesions on the evaluate, response evaluation with PET CT. She was biopsied at that, no, uh, yeah. next please. She was biopsy at that time with a uh, confirmation of a refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. She was treated with salvage chemotherapy with Isha for two cycles next. And after these two cycles, she had persistent hypermetabolic disease with, with a PET CT of the real score four. Next, please. So what are the best treatment options for this patient? This patient? And next. So we can uh, discuss these different options. If salvage chemotherapy still the first choice for primary refractory disease, was ESHAP a good option? And what is the best treatment option for this patient now? To move on to autologous stem cell transplantation in spite of having persistent hypermetabolic lesions, to go on to third line chemotherapy, to use VV as monotherapy, to use VV in combination with chemotherapy, to use checkpoint inhibitors as monotherapy, or checkpoint inhibitors in combination with chemotherapy at this time. And just to uh, not include, or you can comment, but just to uh, uh, remind that VV plus checkpoint inhibitors are not involved in many of these countries. So, and we would just like to know how you would treat this patient or how you treat these uh, situations in your institutions. So um, I can I can start. Um, in my my choice would be to to use a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, most I would prefer to use it in combination with chemotherapy. I don't know if that's something that would end up getting approved, um, but I, I definitely would not move directly to transplant, I would try to get the patient into remission. And, um, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, there's a reasonably good chance that the patient could have a response to a checkpoint inhibitor in combination with chemotherapy. And assuming that is able to, you know, the patient can get into remission at that point, I would still take the patient to an auto transplant after that. And what combination would you use, Allison? Um, well, I, I've been using uh, pembrolizumab in combination with gemcitabine, venerabine, and doxal. Um, and, you know, we've had nice, uh, we've seen nice responses with that combination. Um, you know, I mean, a kind of surprisingly high complete response rates of, of 95%. And so, you know, that's, that's what would be my choice. Would anyone uh, choose VV plus chemotherapy? Or why not? Um, yes, uh, um, I mean, I, I would prefer uh, the checkpoint inhibitor, but uh, we've seen nice responses with uh, BB plus bendamastin. The, the problem is, is probably currently the COVID situation. So, so we try to avoid bendamastin if possible. Uh, and, and if the patient responds, by the way, then, then I think we would also go on to, to transplant. Uh, so, so maybe that could be the second choice. Is uh, also our approach BV chemo and BV banda uh, could be um, uh, 
uh, a choice for us and then move to uh, high dose therapy and uh, auto transplant if uh, complete response is, uh, is obtained. And is there a role for sequential uh, therapy, VB, and if said positive to add chemotherapy? Are the same, Alison, regarding your decision? Would you? Uh, is there a role for starting with checkpoint inhibitors, and if not, CR then combining chemotherapy? I, I think that if if you're worried about how a patient might tolerate it, or you know, I, it certainly could be considered, but it wouldn't be my preferred choice because I my my preference, you know, whether we use single agent uh, checkpoint inhibitor or single agent BV, I you know I think the complete response rate is going to be quite low, and so. I, you know, I'd, I'd rather use the checkpoint inhibitor in, in combination with chemotherapy to try to get the patient into remission faster um, to get them to transplant. But you know, sometimes I'll consider doing something sequential more for if, if it kind of fits into the patient's lifestyle for some reason or another. But in general, I'm going to use combination. I think if, if I may, um... Astrid, I, I, I think we, we know we can choose this patient and um, I, I will not be a proponent of like an escalation uh, of trying something and adding something if it doesn't work, but using, I mean, the best combination regimen. Um, I mean, obviously being in the same institution as Alison, I will follow what Alison said, uh, uh, but I think, uh, uh, combining the best agent, whether BV chemo or checkpoint chemo, uh, rather than using them alone. So, be, because I mean, the goal is to cure this patient, and and I think uh, um, the best chance you bring this patient into CR, uh, probably followed by transplant, is the way to go, unless he's in, he or she is in trial uh, for something else. And if we use checkpoint inhibitors, do we need to achieve a CR, a negative PET-CT to go on to autologous stem cell transplantation? Um, I don't think that's 100% clear. Um, you know, at least in, in the study with brentuximab plus, plus uh, nivolumab, um, not every patient was in a CR who went on to autologous stem cell transplant directly from BV Nevo. And, um, you know, the progression-free survival in, with that treatment plan looked quite favorable. And they also noted some um, pseudo progressions on that study, um, you know, and, and, you know, surprisingly, most of the patients with PEMBRO-GBD we've observed, you know, have been a pretty clear-cut PET negative. Although now, as we're using the regimen more, we're, we're having some patients who are more a little bit borderline. And so I, I don't think it's, I, I think that um, patients with mild residual activity on their PET scan, you know, we, we have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt and, and they maybe don't need to be completely negative in order to go to transplant as long as they're responding. Um, sometimes if it's confusing, you know, it may be reasonable to do a biopsy, um, you know, to, to help clarify what is going on. Um, but I, I guess the, 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 the clear cut answer though is it's not entirely clear that the patients have to be PET negative after a checkpoint inhibitor based therapy, but um, you know I think generally we want them closer, um, and you know I think we need more data from the ongoing studies to to know for sure though. I, I have a question for my colleagues: Is anybody still using, or would you use, uh, maintenance treatment after autologous? Meaning consolidation. I it's not available in our region maintenance treatment so it's not an option for us um and you know the data from allison's study um around this combination being used pre-transplant is pretty compelling we've just started using it locally for some of our toughest cases where um you know calyx is not routinely funded for lymphoma indication so it's sort of special application but um it's been very successful in our hands, although there's a few little technical things that we run into, a bit of re-engraftment syndrome and, and things like that that we've that we've noticed that it's a little bit different to use to use compared to um, not using a checkpoint inhibitor before a transplant. Um, but we we don't have access to BV post-transplant at the moment. 
Alison, may I ask um, how confident are you? You know, what is the success rate with these primary refractory patients as opposed to the relapsed setting? Um, I mean, obviously your job's a lot harder at the, at the start, but, you know, are you as confident with the combination in this setting? I, I am. We, we, we didn't see a difference in response between the primary refractory patients and the relapsed patients. I mean, the study is, you know, relatively small. It was 36 patients um, on, on the study, um, or, you know, 38 patients altogether, 36 who went to transplant. Um, the I, I think what's reassuring now is that we now have longer follow-up from the study. You know, in the original publication, it was only about a medium of a year. Now we have a medium of two years follow-up. There has been one patient who has relapsed on the study. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not as the line, <laughs> the progression-free survival line is not as perfect as was seen in, in the manuscript, but um, but it's still, you know, quite encouraging that all but one patient has remained in remission with a median of two-year follow-up. And so, and, and that's, you know, and, and there's just no difference between primary refractory or relapsed. Um, I, I was gonna, with regard to brintuxma maintenance, I actually do still use it. Um, and actually about a third of the patients on the study um, received it uh, on, on the Pembroke GVD study. And um, the criteria that we tend to use is if, if patients have at least two risk factors um, at, at the time of relapse, so primary refractory or relapse within one year, B symptoms, sexual disease. So, you know, if they, if they have two or more of those risk factors. And, and we have a bunch of patients who are actually brentuximab naive by the time, you know, post-transplant, which is, you know, because we're using Pembro GVD. And so I, I think it's a reasonable thing to consider um, still. Um, and, you know, I certainly, um, I don't know if it's how much of an impact it's making, but, um, but you know, I, I do use it. Astrid, I have a question for the audience. Uh, in the context of uh, resource limiting settings that we don't have access to brentuximab or even checkpoint inhibitors in this moment, uh, I would like to know the opinions about the use of uh, tandem autologous stem cell transplantations for high risk uh, relapse patients, if anybody has something to say, or even radiotherapy at this moment. I have no experience in, in tandem transplantation. Um, I think radiotherapy is very uh, useful in a relapse setting as a consolidation therapy after chemotherapy. We have no experience of tandem uh, transplant either. Um, uh, although we try to incorporate radiotherapy um, if the disease can be easily incorporated in a, in a radiation field. For us, peritransplant radiation is routine um, in, in a, in a non-advanced stage. We have used in the past the tandem uh, transplant. So, and in some in some cases, uh, it would uh, seem uh, to be reasonable because of uh, we get the response otherwise previously non non responded therapy to the standard cell, which and then we consolidate it. But we do not use it anymore in these in these days. <laughs> 